What's going on, y'all? And thanks again for joining uh, me and Philly here on Expanded Perspectives. That's right. Going? It's me. It's Cam. And, uh, of course, Philly's in here. That's now, right. Of course, we were gone last week. Last week was uh, spring break here in uh, Tejas, and my family was out of town, so I was doing just single dad stuff around the house. You like were being crazy. a bachelor for the week. Yeah, yeah. This guy, on the other hand, with me, <laughs> this guy was never home. When did I? Don't think. I'm trying to think as I was I, before we got in here. I was like, I know people are going to be like, "Where y'all at? Where y'all at?" Look, I want to know where Kyle was at because usually we hang out at least once a week, but we talk all the time. Kyle, I didn't get a chance to talk to him. I didn't get a chance to really hang out. I don't think you got home before like 7 or 8 p.m., but like one night? Yeah, it was a really busy week. The kids were out of school for the whole week, so of course they were at the house all day, and I normally work from home yeah. uh, with my my real job. You know, I don't podcast for a living. For some of you that don't follow the show or are new to the show, welcome. Uh, podcasting is a hobby for me and Cam. But uh, So it was very hard to get work done with the kids at home, so we tried to do some of the things. Um Spring is finally here. Yep. So the weather's been warmer, a lot of rain and stuff. But we had our first baseball tournament, and uh, we got home late because of that on Sunday evening. So Monday we really didn't do a whole lot. I went and did some side work. And then, let's see, we went to a state park around here. We did some hiking. Yep. Uh, a lot of exploring. There's a lot of caves and cliffs at this particular park where you can repel. And, man, I'd like to get into that, like repelling with cords and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and ropes and stuff. Good luck with that. Yeah, the the yeah, boys fun. didn't seem interested in it. I would like to do that. I'm not Let's interested in it. add it to the list. No, no You know, I meet no. these people all the time that are retired or they're my age <laughs> and they don't have any hobbies and I just don't understand people like that because there's literally not enough time in the day for me to accomplish everything I would like yeah. to. I constantly don't even per perfect one hobby and I'm already moving on to another. I'm like, oh, that looks like fun. But the problem with repelling is that hobby you could fall from. Well- I don't know if you've seen the you documentary. You can't fall from disc golf. <laughs> Free so yeah, you can't. Free solo. <laughs> but no, I would not be into doing anything like that. But th with the ropes, that would be kind of cool. Uh, Folks, I'd like to go head first. This is going to be dis face first where you're actually looking down as the you're The Australian coming. spider repel. Is that what it's called? Yeah. It, leave it to the Australians to come up with something like right? that. Right. Oh, Luke is uh, speaking of, of Australia. They just discovered a brand new dinosaur this last week. Yeah. It's called like the Galeonosaurus. I know because Luke told me. Galeonosaurus, and uh, it's about seven foot t tall, I think they said it was. I don't know. I've got a quick story for all you folks. But we've been basically, before you get into that, but it was basically we just had a really busy week because of spring break yeah. on top of the normal stuff. Anyways, I over to you. By, I swing by Kyle's house, and uh, we're talking arrows and whatnot this past Saturday, and Luke's playing in the garage, just hanging out in there, and uh, I hear his brothers throw him under the bus because somebody got on the TV and uh, got on the Apple TV and bought, without asking, the new Spider-Man, Spider-Verse cartoon. Uh-huh. And his brothers are like, yeah, that was Luke. So it, it, Luke's, of course, in complete denial. So if you ever need to commit a crime, he's the guy to commit a crime with you. So he's in there playing in the garage, and, and he's always, he's still... He has to yell, Uncle Cam, look at this. And I guess that's going to be until he's probably in his 30s. So he's playing, and he's like, he's asking me some stuff. And I go, hey, I said, are you the man that bought Spider-Man in the multiverse cartoon? And he looks behind him like I'm talking to somebody behind him. There's just a wall, folks. And he turns, and he looks behind him. And then he turns and looks over the other shoulder. And then he looks me dead in the eye and goes, that's a hard no, Uncle Cam. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't necessarily know that I believe you, sir. Yeah. That's his new catchphrase. Hard no and easy yes. He's been, I don't know where he got it from, but he's been saying it an awful lot. And, <laughs> that's a hard no. Uh, I, don't I don't understand why. But oh, uh, happy St. Patrick's Day yep. for you uh, people out there celebrating that. Hopefully none of y'all got in any trouble. Yeah. I didn't. It was one of the lowest, low-key uh, St. Patrick's Day, I think I've ever experienced since I was probably eight. Right. Like, at least when I was a kid, my aunts and uncles, they'd be partying it up. There used to be some it, wicked. It, it looked like a retirement home over at my mother's house. I was back at home by 830 at night. We used to get wild over at your mom and dad's house. Well, I don't even want to bring this up because it was after the St. Patrick's Day party that your dad had his stroke. It was the Sunday after. Yeah. So, like, we had the party on Saturday. It was, like, that Monday morning. Yeah, about 3 o'clock that morning when, yeah, is when it hit. Yeah, he just said he had a bad headache. My mom thought he was just hung over. Yeah, because we'd gone hard in the paint. <laughs> that's just but but that's what used, it used to be. Yeah. That used to be, yeah, which is funny because now all the aunts and uncles are older and everybody's older and nobody's like... There's a lot of gray in the air around out there. So you're like, I'm not partying like I did. Yeah, before. Dr. Powers was the only one still trying to carry the torch. 
Um, How did he make out? I don't know, because I left at like 8.30. He was like, everybody's leaving. I'm like, I'm out of here. I, I remem- got stuff to do. I remember you and I carrying Dr. Powers out of the party from your brother's wedding and putting him in the car. Oh, yeah, like on a gurney. And then he projectile vomited all over the, the dashboard. Inside of the rental car. <laughs> it wasn't my rental car, so I didn't care. And we just patted him on the back and closed the door. <laughs> Make sure you don't drown. You'll be all right. Keep him setting up. We did buckle him in, and it was, oof. Yeah, and also... Uh, in addition to uh, the spring break, having a good time on spring break. See, last spring break, we went up to Broken Bow, mm-hmm. Oklahoma, did a lot of fishing and stuff. And we didn't get a chance to do that this year because uh, I took the family to Galveston uh, in January. And we're, I'm trying to save some money for to buy a new house. I need a bigger house. Yeah. We've kind of outgrown this one. When me and Delee moved in, it was just me and her and the brood. And then Luke came along. But anyways, um, so I ordered these specialty arrows because I'm going with the new setup. And you got some too. And like, you know, I'm like a little kid. We've talked about it before on a previous episode, like waiting for the the shipment. I had to wait like four weeks, which is like an, an, an it's so long nowadays compared to the way it used to be. Right. So it felt like it was forever. Finally got a man super excited. Yeah. It doesn't work with the broad heads I purchased. So he ordered the wrong setup. <laughs> I felt like I was going to cry. I was bummed out for like four hours. I'd be like, I've been waiting for weeks and now I've messed it up. And it wasn't the company's fault or the guys that shipped it. It was completely my fault. I went back and looked and yeah, the diameters don't line up. Not at all. I should have known. <laughs> I just got all geeked out and I was all excited and just started buying stuff. Right. <laughs> I'll tell you how my week started off. I was all excited. I got to work. Uh, of course, you know, it's Monday. Nobody enjoys going on a Monday. You're like, oh, here we go. I got to work. Had to, you know, it, it wasn't bad. It was just like normal stuff. You know, you get it all together. And I'm like, I know what'll make it better. I'm going to go get a coffee. Now, we have coffee in our big break room at work, right? Yeah, that's just like the Keurig or it the was, crap coffee, It, it right? was crap coffee. We, yeah. We've got one of those giant, like everybody's got, I don't know who, whatever the name of it is, but it holds like four pots of coffee. Bun, D. B-U-N-N. That's it, yeah. And this thing is ginormous. And they have all, because everybody in the whole office, there's probably like 75 or 80 of us in that, maybe a little bit more now, but that's it, at least 80 of us down there in that big in that big uh, center. And so everybody pretty much drinks coffee. Uh-huh. But it's not good coffee. Right? No. Once so you I'm get like, used to like a French press and yeah, freshly yeah, yeah. ground, you can't go back. So I'm like, I'm going to go and get me a nice coffee. And I don't. I don't do the Starbucks. I, I've done the Starbucks thing, but I don't do it anymore. But there's a few coffee spots around here in town I go to. So I go and I get my coffee and I go in and order. And I'm like tickled, right? But I've got so much going on in my in my mind. I'm going through stuff and I set it up on the top of my car and I'm doing all that stuff. <laughs> and then I get like two miles down the road and I go to grab my coffee. And guess what? Daddy's coffee ain't there no more. <laughs> Daddy's coffee was on top of the car. And it doesn't ride as well either. And I, I almost cried. I'm like, all I wanted was a nice coffee. And I don't, like we've talked about, I use just very little sweetener. and That's it. Like, mm-hmm. that's it. Like most, And then it's just black bean water. That's all I want. And I was so excited. And then I just, I spilled my did coffee. Did you stop and get and, another coffee? Or are you just so mad at that point? You're like, forget it. I'm just done. <laughs> no, I went and got another one. <laughs> I did you? <laughs> I was, I walked back in and they were like, uh, that was fast. And I go, yeah, it hit the ground. And they're like, what? And I said, I put it on my car and drove away. They hooked me up with a free one. Did they really? Yep. Well, yep. man, check that yep. out. They were like, oh, man. And I'm like, yeah, I go in there often. And they were like, don't worry about it here. This one's on us. And I was like, dude, you, it, it, it kind of revamped the Monday, right? So Random acts of kindness I, always exactly. makes your week a little better. It did, right? man. And it, it really, it was pretty it was pretty jam up. And speaking of jam up, I got you something here that's jam up. Bro. Oh, please, lay it on me. Uh, this comes from Cryptozoology News. Of course. Uh, a Mahoan County resident. Claims that he saw this, a short ape-like creature, which could have very easily been myself, says that this is a hunter. And he tells of an encounter he had with a four-foot-tall albino Bigfoot. Says he was getting his hunting gear out of his truck when he noticed the being was in, it was, and this is back mid-afternoon, November 12th, 2013. Mm-hmm. The fellow goes on to say this, about 50, or yeah, about 50 or so feet to the left of a group of turkey was what appeared to be an albino something. And it must have been sitting or lying down at the time. Now, this is what he was telling the BRFRO. He said, by the time I was ready to get in the woods, the turkey and that thing was out of sight. Now, he explains that he'd entered the woods, and that's when he came face to face with it. He said, this was this thing was white and fuzzy and standing on two legs, and it was looking at me. It's looking at me, Ray. And it says, reportedly, after a minute of staring at each other, the man decides to approach it. And he said the creature didn't look intimidating because it was mostly because it was four foot tall. 
He says, it turned and fled. He said, I couldn't wrap my head around what the hell it was I just saw. Now, here you go. He said he adds that it showed up again. He says that he tried taking a better look at it this time using his rifle's scope. There you go. I know there's a lot of viewers out there or viewers, listeners out there that always talk about how come these guys never have any weapons? Yeah. This guy had his rifle. He said, but my hands kept shaking and it didn't feel right putting a rifle up at something I didn't understand. He said, I would get within 40 yards or so and it would back up, then flee, then popped out a third time. Said, I got a weird feeling of cat and mouse because animals don't act like this. It was playing with me, and I felt I was being lured into something. With the creature still inside, he said, I turned around and went home. Now, he goes on to talk about, of course, he's like, I'm you know, I'm an avid outdoorsman. I hunt and all this. I've never seen anything like this before, nor have I seen anything like this afterwards. Now, look, I know a lot of people also talk about, and we've discussed it, and everybody goes, to the fact, oh, it could be a bear walking upright. We've discussed it numerous times. Well, what's the odds of a four foot tall upright walking bear that's albino white? Yeah, right. That you're going to come across. You know, it's it's the, my whole the whole problem with this whole thing is, of course, like I said, this is up in Ohio, right? So let's this is the strange Ohio's got some really strange stuff that goes on. A lot of strange things. There's only two explanations for this. One, it's exactly what he saw, or two, he's a liar. That's the only two explanations you have. There's no misidentifying a four foot tall albino that keeps coming and playing with you, cat and mouse like. That's that's not. A <coughs> no, you're 100 percent right. It. That's the only two answers he, that they have. He, he mentions the fact that he felt like it was trying to lure him, and lure this him. is yeah. this is a common with this is very common with like puck wudgies yep. sightings like that where these tricksters. They're trying to lure you into the woods, and and no one really knows why. But you know, maybe that's the reason so many missing people happen. Except Joshua Cutchin, he in, seems in to know why. Yeah, Joshua, knows. he's big on the whole faith thing. He's big on the so, faith. Yeah, folk. he knows. A lot. But you're right. Maybe this is. Maybe that could have been something along the lines of uh, more the missing four one one. Because think about it. How easy would it be to get drawn into not just following a, a small Bigfoot, but now you're looking at an albino. And I've already discussed albinos in the past yep, on this yep. show. We know how society views it is it's almost like something that's mythical Mm -hmm. so how easy would that be if you were some sort of trickster to you know set yourself to look as such you're going to get lured into something and maybe it was maybe it was luring him a little bit deeper and the big ones were hiding around the corner going to roll him that's like an albino bigfoot prostitute that's going to lure you into a dark alley and the big the bigfoot pimps are going to come over there and beat you down and take your wallet take your wallet that's possible Check this out. we got a recent UFO sighting. It says that around 9 p.m. local time on Saturday, March 16th, 2019, an air ambulance helicopter was flying roughly 15 miles west of central Las Vegas when something odd caught the pilot's eye. Now, it was an aided eye. Now, during an exchange with an air traffic controller, the pilot of Mercy Air 21, which is an Augusta 119 Koala helicopter, uh... Yeah, I have no idea. It's the (laughs) particular model and type if you're a helicopter aficionado. He noted that he spotted some unidentified object at the distance from his position, but he was only able to see it whenever he engaged his night vision goggles. When he tried to look at the object with normal vision, he couldn't see it. It also was not on the radar. So he called the tower and the controller responded that he had nothing on his radar in the area. And when the pilot told the controller that he can only see it when he uses his night vision goggles, the the control tower guy seemed to respond with amazement. I got a small clip here. Let's take a listen. Our Sierra 21 radar contact, 15 to the west of Las Vegas. Uh, VOR, straight through Bravo airspace. Hey, 21, position checks. And just to advise, it looks like I have uh, some sort of object over the Southern Hills area. Looks to be about 7,000 feet. Could be a balloon or something along those lines. It's just unlit, so uh, just advise. Okay, uh, I'm not seeing anything in that area, but just not to say, uh, like you're saying, there's something out there. Yeah, I can only see it. Uh, I got the uh, night vision goggles on. I can only see it through the goggles. Oh, that's awesome. So there you go. He can see something. He doesn't know what it is. It's an orb-like object about 7,000 feet high. The, the the pilot even mentions it could be a balloon, but I don't know why it would be glowing when only through night vision goggles. I just like his response. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's all the guy says. So that's pretty. <laughs> and he's right. That is awesome. Right? So, I mean, what, what could this guy have seen? Is it some kind of uh, extraterrestrial device using some t- type of cloaking device? I don't know. 
Pretty interesting stuff. Uh, speaking of interesting, let's take a break. And when I get back from the break, I'm going to be talking about the CC mite, which is also known as the Mexican Bigfoot. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. Sightings of large, hairy ape-like creatures, or wildmen, have come from all over the world. These monstrous beasts have appeared on every continent other than Antarctica and go by many names. The Yeti, the Almasti, the Yowie, the Yeren, Orang Pendek, the Grassman, the Skunk Ape, Sasquatch, and of course, Bigfoot which happens to be my least favorite name, as well as up to 63 other names, depending on which region of the globe you are located. People from all over all describe a similar thing. So, what are they seeing? Is it physical or is it ethereal? If it is real, how can we never find any physical remains? If it's not flesh and blood, not physical, then why do we find footprints? Large trees broken over in the woods, even crude lean-tos or nests made of sticks and leaves deep within the forest. I don't know. Now, most people, when they think about Sasquatch, they think about the Pacific Northwest. They definitely think of deep and dark forests, sometimes even swamps. But they don't usually think about the desert. But let me tell you, there have been a lot of sightings of a hairy hominid in the desert regions of the world. And on today's show, I'm going to be talking about some of these encounters in the deserts of Southern California and Northern Mexico. Let's start at the beginning. One of the earliest known sightings in this particular area of the world took place in San Diego County, California in an area known as the Borrego Badlands, or the Borrego Sink. This is, as you can imagine, a very lonely place. A large patch of wasteland, of uninhabitable desert, a vast sprawl of dry canyons, deep crevasses, caves, and arroyos. The last place you would ever think that a large hairy monster would live. Yet, there are sightings of something wild, something hairy, and very aggressive, that has been spotted in this area for centuries. When the Spanish missionaries first came to San Diego in 1769, they heard numerous stories from the local natives of the region of what were roughly translated as hairy devils, which were foul-smelling, man-like beasts that were avoided at all costs and which lived along the Santa Ana River. The natives referred to the home of the creatures as Tawis Puki, or the Camp of the Devil, and warned every outsider to stay well away from these creatures. Apparently, this was not just rumors. In fact, in the mid-1800s, an area just west of the Anza Borrego Desert State Park, called Dead Man's Hole, became an important stop-off point for various stagecoach lines, crisscrossing the harsh, unrelenting desert landscape. In the year 1876, sightings began to come in of a hairy, man-like beast that was stalking the area, with the first such account being from a stagecoach passenger who claimed to have seen one of the creatures staring at them from behind some brush. Not long after this report, there was a series of strange deaths in the vicinity, the victims typically looking as if they had been killed and torn apart by some very large predator. This was naturally blamed on the many sightings of the wild hairy devils that had been seen in the area. An actual report was published in the San Diego Union, a local newspaper, in April of 1876 about a local prospector named Turner Helm. Now, according to the report, Helm was out in the desert near Dead Man's Hole on the Warner Ranch when he encountered a large hairy creature. 
Helm described the man-like monster as being completely covered in hair, with very dark fur like that of a bear. It was large and frightening, with the face that resembled a human, but not quite. Something different. He first saw this creature as it was perched on top of a large boulder, and as he approached the thing, (laughs) it stood up. He said in his own words, it was covered all over with coarse black hair, seemingly two or three inches long, like the hair of a bear. His beard and the hair of his head were long and thick. He was a man of medium size and had rather fine features, not at all like those of an Indian, but more like an American or Spaniard. Now, Mr. Helm and his friend tried to speak with the thing, They called out to it in English and Spanish and even some local Native American, but got no response. The beast just stared at them and then began to walk towards them, only backing off when the two frightened prospectors pulled out their rifles and aimed at it. That's not all, folks. There was another report in an entirely different newspaper, this time the San Diego Transcript. In March of 1888, The paper told of an incredible story of two hunters, a guy named Mr. Charles Cox and a guy named Mr. Edward Dean, who took it upon themselves to find and kill the beast that was responsible for a bunch of unsolved murders near, you guessed it, Dead Man's Hole. The two armed men went out into the desert in the area where several sightings had recently taken place, and it didn't take too long before they found what they were looking for. This is how they described the creature. Its legs were long, and they were used with such ease and facility in climbing over the rocks and logs that on second thought, the animal appeared more like an immense gorilla. Its hair was dark brown, and it was at least six feet in height. The front legs from their use resembled arms, and the beast moved almost uprightly, like a man or a monkey. Its body was quite round and covered with extremely long hair and entirely devoid of any tail. The arms and the hands of the beast greatly resembled those of a human being and the facial features, unmistakably Indian in character. But the teeth were plainly those of a carnivorous animal. Now, Mr. Cox and Dean claimed that they both opened fire on the hulking hairy beast and reportedly killed it. The carcass was estimated as weighing around 400 pounds, and the two men quickly decided that it was most likely the perpetrator of all the grisly attacks that had plagued the region. They apparently went about trying to have it shipped off to San Diego to be examined and put on display, but conveniently, the corpse would end up going missing. There were even more sightings from this area of the world. The creature was dubbed the moniker the Borrego Sandman, and would continue to be sighted in the area and grew in popularity. Soon, people from all over the world claimed to have seen the monster here and there, and it became hard to determine which sightings were genuine and which ones were just conjured up to frighten small children. Again, in 1939, a local shop owner claimed that he had been out camping near the Borrego Sink when he had been surrounded by a pack of large, ape-like creatures with silver hair all over their bodies and large, glowing red eyes. The menacing beasts reportedly circled the camp for some time, but were frightened by the campfire and eventually slinked back off into the desert night. As time went on, sightings of this creature would ramp up, and other times, they would die back down. There were years that went by that had a lot of activity, And then there were patches of years where nothing at all was seen. No activity at all. In 1964, this was a particularly busy year. There were several sightings of the Borrego Sandman. Reports of large rocks being thrown. Ranchers reported missing and mutilated cattle. And even strange tracks were seen in the area. In fact, a Marine by the name of Victor Stoniau was out hiking in the area, just enjoying the nice weather when he spotted some very unusual tracks in the desert sand. Now, he claimed that the footprints were quite large, 
14 inches long and about eight and a half inches wide. Most interestingly, he claimed that whatever made the tracks had only three toes. In 1968, another man named Harold Lancaster was out prospecting when he reportedly spotted one of the hairy creatures. He told the local newspapers, I saw a man walking in the desert. The figure came closer. I thought it was another prospector. Then I picked up my binoculars and saw the strangest sight in my life. It was a real giant ape man. I had heard about the screaming giant ape man up in Tulum County that frightened people for a couple of years. Another person and I even went up there to look for the thing. I decided it was a hoax and never expected to actually see one. That thing was big. I was no match for it. I had a 22 pistol on my hip, but it would have been like shooting at a gorilla with a pea shooter. I was afraid the beast might get too close, so I fired a couple of rounds into the air. The Sandman jumped a good three feet off the ground when the sounds of the shots reached him. He turned his head, looked towards me, and then took off running in the other direction. There were even a series of sightings from the early 1950s up into the early 1970s at a local drag racing track. Located just outside Fontana, California, lies the Mickey Thompson International Dragway. And during that time, people would come to the track every weekend to participate in and to watch the drag races. They would often bring campers or tents and stay for the entire weekend. Now, drag racing is very loud, so you would think that this would scare off any of the local wildlife, but I guess not the Sandman. Multiple spectators came forward with strange accounts of seeing something lurking around the track and the parking lot and the camping area at night. Always at night. One young boy in 1965 claimed that he had attended the drag race one night and while walking home, something lunged out of the bushes and tried to grab him. Whatever it was, it was large and hairy, he claimed. Somehow, the boy managed to escape, but his clothes were badly torn. In another strange case, this time a young woman named Jerry Mendenhall, who said she had parked her car along the Sierra Avenue near the Jerupa Hills Regional Park in Fontana when a large, hair-covered monster, covered in mud and smelling like a dead animal, accosted her by grabbing her through her window, after which she floored it and managed to get away. In the end, the creature was seen by hundreds of people at the raceway and others in and around Fontana, California, to the point that it quickly gained the nickname of the Speedway Monster, and sightings continued, even after the racetrack closed its doors. In 1975, a group of Boy Scouts came face to face with the beast, marauding through their campsite. And again, in 1976, it was seen near a cabin at Big Bear. Another witness claimed that the monster was stealing chickens from his property in 1991. And in 1992, several motorists on Foothill Boulevard spotted it making its way along the railroad tracks that passed right by a rather busy street in an area that was not particularly remote or isolated at the time. There are even more stories, including some very strange sightings in and around Edwards Air Force Base. On more than one occasion, multiple nighttime guards came forward reporting to their commanders that they had observed large Bigfoot-like creatures with their night vision equipment lurking around the perimeter of the base, sometimes walking through it, and even venturing into the many underground tunnels in the area. The witnesses explained that the presence of the creatures was officially classified and that they had been specifically warned not to open fire on them. There had allegedly been several instances of catching the creatures on surveillance cameras at the base, but this footage was labeled as classified and never released to the public. In 1977, a Douglas E. Trapp of the Southwestern Bigfoot Research Team and his friend Corey Rudolph had an encounter with such a beast in Corona on the northeast slope of the Santa Ana mountain range, which 
had been the location of a good amount of Bigfoot sightings in the previous years. In his own words, this is what Douglas Trapp had to say. He said it was near 2 a.m. in the morning on a clear autumn night in 1977 when Corey Rudolph and I pulled up to the Dead End Street in Corona on the northeast slope of the Santa Ana mountain range in Southern California. Only two years had passed since the reports offered by Alan Barry and Ann Slate of several good Bigfoot reports at this location. Corey and I were still beginners at this, yet extremely interested in learning as much as we could about these desert man-beasts. Although neither of us were sure of our beliefs in such animals, we were determined to find the truth. This road was long and winding, and after several miles it came to an abrupt end. According to the reports, high school students in the area used this place as a necking site. And for a period of about five years, several of these students had claimed to have been confronted by a very tall, hair-covered man-like ape that walked on two legs. Below the dead end was a citrus orchard where this manimal had also been seen and heard. No one had ever had the nerve to search for footprints, and that was our goal. We realized that this creature may long be gone, but we thought a chance would offer us some evidence. We sat quietly in the Datsun pickup truck with the windows rolled down and the dome light on, reading literature collected from Slate and Barry and old newspapers. Suddenly, the hair on our necks arose and a loud crashing noise was heard coming from below us in the orchard. We were frozen with awe as this thing lumbered through the trees with great force, breaking and snapping limbs with its girth. As we listened, we estimated that this animal was very large and very fast. It could be a deer, we first thought. Then came the loud grunt and a low moan of something that definitely was not a deer. Corey looked at me, turned the ignition key, put it in first, and popped the clutch. We almost did a wheelie in the little truck, and neither of us looked back. The reports we had read indicated that this previously seen monster might be dangerous and aggressive. It had, on more than one occasion, approached necking teenagers and rocked their vehicles. Neither of us were willing to let this thing rock our truck. The fear was real, almost instinctive, like there was some sort of inherent warning. The reports we read had mentioned similar feelings by prior witnesses. We never returned to that site, but continued to engross ourselves with investigating Sasquatch reports throughout Southern California. Now he goes on to say that during the period from 1977 to 1980, Corey and I interviewed about 20 credible eyewitnesses in Southern California. Most of these reports were from desert regions surrounding Los Angeles, from the Bakersfield area to as far south as San Diego. From these accounts, we were able to develop a profile of these man beasts of the desert, as illustrated in some of our reports. This compilation describes the average desert Sasquatch in appearance and behavior, of which the latter appears to be somewhat unique in comparison to Sasquatch profiles from other areas of North America. Although our research ended in 1980, sightings and footprints discoveries continue to this day in these same areas. And the general description is this, very tall, 10 to 12 feet high, covered with short, dark hair, except the ape-like face, a conical-shaped head, very broad shoulders, a slim waist, long legs, arms reaching the knees, ape-like hands, no opposable thumb, palms, and base of feet hairless, very large, 18 to 24 inches long, with five and sometimes three toes. It also has an odor described by many to be skunk-like or that of a dead animal. Now, curious of people, this beast, whatever it is, is curious of man-made objects, whether they be cars, trucks, trains, trash cans, road signs, houses, the list goes on. And sometimes it's been noted as being aggressive. It's been reported to pick up and throw trash cans and bend road signs and light posts, reported to rock 
occupants' vehicles and pound on hoods, sometimes leaving handprints on windows. This thing shows its teeth in an aggressive manner. It runs at occupied vehicles and sometimes gives chase to retreating vehicles. Apparently, this thing is fearless of man. It's been reported several times picking up hot sticks from campfires and throwing them into the air. It's been reported as of stealing fish hung out to dry by Native Americans. And it's been reported as the killing or chasing dogs on more than one occasion. This thing, whatever it is, is strictly nocturnal. It's usually only witnessed at night, usually around midnight or even later. This thing walks mainly on rocks or on pavement, apparently to hide its tracks, according to some. It can walk up boulders with ease and without the use of hands. It can walk very fast and disappears into the dark quickly. Often reported to have red glowing eyes and total darkness without external light sources. Sometimes they are seen in groups of three or four in open desert areas from a distance by military personnel, and apparently they are nomadic, although certain individuals have repeatedly been seen in the same vicinity by different eyewitnesses over long periods of time. Nocturnal activity appears to be dedicated to food search, including campsites, trash cans, dump sites, etc. In Hemet, we actually saw and cast 18-inch-long footprints left by what we believe was a Sasquatch just two nights before our arrival in 1979. These tracks were spaced about six feet apart, and each foot was facing directly forward in each step, unlike a human stride that usually shows up step with a light outward position. There were 17 tracks that ran along the edge of a dirt road that had been muddy on the night of the incident. The distance from the first to the last of the 17 tracks was 101 feet. These tracks indicated a three-toed creature, although this may have been caused by the weight shift in the mud, making the actual number of toes indiscernible. We camped out at this location on several occasions but had no Sasquatch encounters. The reports claimed that this animal returned approximately two weeks after Danny Perez and I made our first weekend visit, but the ground was too dry to leave any tracks. One notable point, in all of these cases we investigated, was that the reportees' dogs often cowered under tables and beds whenever these creatures were nearby. A couple of the eyewitnesses had multiple encounters that only occurred upon investigating what their dogs were cowering from. Looking out the window, a Sasquatch would be seen either standing or walking within close proximity. Several witnesses said they found their trash cans moved around or dumped after the sighting. One Sasquatch in Palmdale bent a street sign with its weight. Now, sightings in this area have continued up until this very day. In and around the area, what is known now as the Anza Borrego Desert State Park. Sightings have also happened south of California, down deep into Mexico. Mexico actually has a long history of its very own ape-like creature that has been seen since Incan and Mayan times, known as the Olmec Ape or the Sisamite. There have even been ancient figurines dating back 2,000 years of a large ape-like creature that have been found in Aztec ruins. Cam, I think, talked about some of these in our episode titled Land of the Wood Ape. So, although reports of the Borrego Sandman are small in comparison to its northern cousin, the Sasquatch, there still are many sightings. I wonder... Are they the same thing? Or perhaps are they some sort of subspecies of the same critter? Again, why do so many people see them? Why are they a part of almost every culture? And why can't we ever find any physical remains? Are they real? Or is it simply hoaxes or misidentification? Certainly some of the reports probably are. But where there's smoke, there's fire. I believe some of those reports to be true. But in the end, it's up to you. I don't have the answers, but it's fun to daydream. Let's take a break. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. And we're back with Expanded Perspectives. Uh, very interesting stories about Sasquatch. Um, I was just at my mother's St. Patrick's Day party, and I was speaking with a couple of my uncles. And, and they're both fascinated by Sasquatch and Bigfoot and things like that. And uh, one of them actually told me an interesting story where they knew an old man. 
Uh, and the old man recently uh, told one of them that when he was out like bailing hay in the late seventies, he and his son, I guess who was a teenager at the time was helping him. And they saw something large, hairy and bipedal walk across the field. Now this took place here in North central Texas and the old man, you know, because they were a different generation. He didn't report anything. He didn't mm-hmm. tell anybody down at the feed store or at church or, or anywhere else, the VFW or anything, or if he did, he, he told my uncle he didn't. Yeah. But um, once again, how many of these sightings happen all the time by normal people and they're just never talked about? How many people never even tell their close family member? Like, they never tell anybody. I think there's a bunch. I think so, right? I really do. I really believe out of all the ones that we get reported, and we say this all the time, I think there's a lot more that... I think, go unreported. I think people nowadays are more likely to report it than they were the older generation. Well, I, I mean, you know what I mean? When I just get the impression that like if you're if you're like World War II age, you know, that generation that you just you were told to keep your mouth shut. It's none of your business, keep your mouth shut. Yeah, but I don't I can't even go that far because you and I have friends that we've grown up with that have told us strange things that have happened to them that they don't report and don't talk about. Yeah, I know. I just don't know. I still don't think it's a, a common thing. I think to report an experience or a sighting of anything, I believe is the uncommon. I don't believe it's just, I don't, I, even though there's a, a, a freedom of this information and it's a lot easier to go online and report it. I still don't believe that it gets done as much as we like to believe it does. I think that there is a lot more people that just, they just see it, and they may tell a few friends, and right. then that's as far as it and, goes. And once again, uh, you know, this is another part of the world where this is being seen. So it's not like it's only been seen in British Columbia, Washington State. This, whatever people are seeing, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Skunk Ape, whatever name you want to give it. Mm-hmm. Why are there people all over the world all seeing something very similar, yet we have no physical remains to me, it cannot be something physical. It has to be something that's able to travel between universes, parallel dimensions, or it's like a spirit. It's not physical because it would have to be something found. It's just improbable to me that that many people, like what's the, always the joke they always say, that Bigfoot's like, he's the king of hide and go seek. Yeah, yeah, the reigning, because it's reigning a, world I mean, champion of hide and seek. They just found another dinosaur in Australia. Yeah. How come no one can find the remains of this? If it's real, but why are so many people seeing it? Uh, I don't know. That's I, the question. That, that is the, the $10 million question. Well, is what and, that is, is why are there no remains? Why is, because I can't explain like you and I talk about it, every time it's at least once a week. I flip flop. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> I go from the fact that it's, it's real to the fact that it's not real. I don't know. That's what makes me keep. That's what I think. What, like we've always said before, I don't want them to find it. I don't want, I like that. That's still that mystery. Yeah, the magic's but, over, right? Yeah, because yeah, I hate the idea, and like you and I have discussed this, and I've told all of you listeners before, too, I hate the idea of us being born at this time when we were born too late to explore the world, mm. but too soon to explore the universe. I started watching a show, and I finished it all. It's on Amazon Prime, and it used to be on Sci-Fi. It's called The Expanse. Uh-huh. And it's, you know, it's all about, you know, like going from here to the moon or here to Mars and all this stuff. And it's one of those things that you're kind of like, I understand, I kind of get drawn into those because that's the exploration of what it used to be like for sailors Uh. is they used to go and explore all these other worlds. And it was like that you sailed the ocean, like you would go through space to get there because there's nothing and one mistake and you're dead. So the space is, you know, was much like that. So that exploration and, and it's one of those deals like I, I want that. I like to hold on to these stories and these sightings, and I love that because it still kind of keeps the mystical, weird, magic part of our world. I like that. And, and it could be silly, and it is a silly thing for me to hold on to, but I personally enjoy I, I that feel part. You. Yeah. Um, what was the the new Netflix series that Kevy Kev uh, shouted at us about? Uh, um, Love, Death, and Robots. I watched about four episodes Good of it. stuff, isn't Pretty it? Pretty cool. You should Dude, check it out. It. They're little shorts. Like Some of them are only ten nine, minutes. ten minutes yeah. long. I like them. Uh, the boys like the one about the the shapeshifters, um, and the one about the ice box. Mm, uh, oh, you'll yeah, have to check yeah. it out. Uh, something you don't need to check out if you want a movie review is uh, on HBO this last weekend or this during sometime during the last week during spring break. I watched a movie called Geostorm with Gerard Butler. 
Oh, how was it? Was it amazing? Don't watch it, folks. It's the worst. I mean, it's terrible. It's it's terrible. It's the worst, huh? Uh, it, it was it was garbage. I mean, there was things happening in the movie that basically the plot is stupid. It the Whoa, special effects sir. are just ridiculous. Okay, so like, there's these satellites that cover the entire globe, and they and they stop. Get ready, folks. Hurricanes. Spoiler, Spoiler alert. Yeah, this folks. is all. Spo- well, I'm spoiling a movie that you shouldn't watch. I'm doing you a favor. <laughs> The premise that all these satellites can stop hurricanes and stop tornadoes and stop tsunamis, but then somebody in the government takes you don't over that? and they're going to use it and they activate all these at the same time, causing a geo storm, right? But there's like ridiculous stuff happening, like lightning, like uncontrollable lightning, which shows the lightning bolt strike a football stadium and the whole stadium explodes. I'm like, don't they have lightning rods on them? That's a I real mean, like, powerful. why? It's, is it. Was the was the football stadium filled with helium? I mean, this. hydrogen or something? I'm like, why did it blow up? It's just a lightning bolt strike a car and the car blows up. I'm like, don't they tell you to hide in your car? It's grounded, right? Yeah. Wow. Th- that's just the beginning. And then the acting, world-class acting. Here we go. How did Gerard Butler used to be like so good in movies uh, and now whoa, whoa, so whoa, bad? Whoa, 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 whoa. Pump the brakes on that, bro. I wouldn't use the words so good. Okay, you might be All right. right. I mean, come on. It just on. seemed like he had better mo- I mean, the acting. And what was the Just because other- you liked the 300 doesn't mean that he was a great actor. You're talking about with the, that's not even really his real body. Yeah, uh, yeah pro- I thought it, they all got in shape for that, didn't they? Uh, I think I read where he, he was like pretty much all CGI. <laughs> they would have to CGI me. I'd have to be wearing a big giant green suit. I'd like a green M&M running around in there. Uh, and what was the other one I watched with my wife? Something with Ben Affleck on Netflix. Gosh darn it. I Triple Frontier. That's it. Another. Uh, Do yourself a favor, <laughs> folks. I did the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and help you out. Find something else to do before you click on that. Like, uh, I don't know, watch paint dry. Uh, I don't know, trim your toenails. Yeah. Like pretty much anything. I don't know, hit yourself in the face with a hammer. I mean, pretty much anything. Because I was all excited for Pedro Pascal. Because I'm a huge, I really like that dude since Narcos. I really like him and all that, right? And I was all pumped. And I start watching this and I'm like, (sighs) this is it? This is what I'm waiting around for? Yeah, like I was... Really, I was expecting Ben Affleck to be the lead, but even the 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 filmers knew that he was doing a poor job and had him killed off pretty early. So I mean, <laughs> it was not very good. Uh, yeah, folks. Uh, yeah, so we're trying to help. But you uh, out if here. you had to pick between the two, if you just had to, definitely- Geostorm. No, <laughs> no, Geostorm. Because it's if I'm gonna pick one, I want the craziest thing I can watch. All right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, it's that's what you want. Now, I haven't got to go see uh, Captain Marvel yet, but my daughter went and watched it. My boys went and watched she it. She liked it. The, the boys liked it. She was a fan. She's a fan of the Captain but you Marvel. Get low, you get Luke like a big Dr. Pepper, a big you know tub of popcorn and some sprees. I mean, he's, he likes he anything. pretty much watch anything. He's down for whatever. Anything. I feel him. I feel him. And apparently there's a new Godzilla movie coming out. So oh, he's already have, losing we gotta go his check mind that on that. And what was the other movie he was telling me about? I, I don't know. We'll think about it some other time. Yeah, he's, he, we're going to have to go check those. I've got out. a huge long list of documentaries people have been sending me to to watch. That's um, what I love the most when we do these. Start talking about movies and shows. Is all the people that respond yeah, with other movies and shows. I'm like, I didn't even know this existed. And some people send me links to documentaries just off like YouTube because then, YouTube is so big. Yeah, that if you didn't know about it, how would you know? It, like it'd have to be something related to that for it to pop up. So people send me these documentaries never even heard of him and then i'll watch him and be like dude you know what that was really good i'm gonna start a whole new podcast and it's gonna be called shark watch because apparently all of you listeners are sick twisted individuals and we get these emails and mariam will forward them directly to my phone of all these links of different crazy shark stuff going on around the world <laughs> and my phone is physically heavier from all these shark attack links and dead sharks and seeing sharks underwater and catching sharks and all like shark rama That's what it is. It's, I have Sharknado on my phone. That's the way it's going. They like to haunt me with those things. That's crazy. And it works. It works. Yeah. Yeah. I'm still not getting in the salt water. If you still, ha- still out. <laughs> if you have any documentaries or movies that you think we and Cam need to check out, be sure to email us at expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. You can also forward us stories or sightings of your own. And or you can call the show 817-945-3828. Don't forget about Expanded Perspectives Elite. There's extra content over there every month, as well as access to the entire back catalog. There's like 250 sh- episodes over there. Uh, signing up is easy. You just got to go to the website, expandedperspectives.com. Click on the Elite tab. It's $5 a month. Uh, Cam, what do you got planned for the rest of your week? Anything special? 
Uh, no, I actually, I don't believe so. I don't think I've got anything crazy going on this week. My great niece's uh, birthday party is Sunday. So that's the only thing that I've, I know that is set in stone that I have to have planned. Outside of that, I'm flexible. I'm seeing what's I up. I hear you, man. We're stuck in the Ides of March. Till next time, folks, be careful. I'm Kyle Filson. He's Cam Hale. Peace, y'all.